Hello and welcome back. Uh, continuing on the saga of the Gert Big Toroid. We need to go back in time again. It's one of them jobbies, I'm afraid. Right, we're all ready to wind the, sec to wind the secondary now. I've wound a bobbin with 420 turns on. Well, that's with 100 turns on. And I'm just giving it a loading test. 100 turns gives us 132 we're testing the uh, primary secondary insulation on this big toroid I tested it up to a thousand volts tested the insulation and it works out at about 500 mega home 500 meg if I think I've got that right basically read 5 off here times it by 100 now testing it at 10,000 volts. Uh, yeah, I'll put you on the thing. Basically, what you're listening for, you're listening for lots of crackles and if the meter will refuse to go forward. It's cranking it up slowly. It takes a while for the HT to come up. EHT, should I say. We added a thousand volts there. So this is 2,000, I'll pull you in a bit, 2,000, 4,000, 6, 8, 10. So at 2,000 volts there's no insulation breakdown, just the odd click. Oops, so playing you better. I think that's, there's a lot of capacitance between the primary and secondary. I think that's what that washing noise is. 4,000 4, volts. You can see that. 6,000 volts. A little bit of hissing, a little bit of crackling. Eight thousand volts. A bit more noise now. Still okay. Ten thousand volts. Still fine. Oh, the camera turned off there again. It's really is a pain in the arse. I think the switch is a bit dodgy on it. Anyway, hope there's no high voltage on there. Right, let's do secondary to secondary. I don't expect it to be as good, so we've got one secondary to the secondary. Put you on the meter. Thousand. Two thousand. Four. See that there? That's a little bit of breakdown there. Let's turn that down, it's sweet lad. Yeah, we've got a little bit of breakdown there. If you saw, they were like a, a click. Don't know where that was breaking down to, but that's still good. So I'd be quite happy to run this at uh, 2 kilovolts. Easy. Just with a crack, I'm just testing this old C chord transformer. I think it's probably a Partridge or Palmaco, something like that. Now then, this transformer here was the top of the range sort of transformer you would get at the time, like the 1950s, 60s maybe. But in those days, you didn't have modern insulation like cut from tape and all that, and you know, all the plastics. So, this is basically using paper and varnish. In, uh, vacuum impregnated varnish. When we turn the voltage up you'll notice that if it's really good insulation it will stay up here. If the insulation isn't so good it'll go down this end. Let's crank it up. We're on 10,000 volts at 100 microamps. 
pointy there. Point two times by a hundred. We'll just turn that up a bit, otherwise it makes a right then. Right, so that's one point two times by a hundred. One thousand two hundred mag. It's still good. Let's cut it short and go. All right, but you see there on that lower range, not so good. We're on one microamp now. Yeah, it's, it's just bottoming out. If that needle jumps, the insulation is breaking down. Yeah. Right, so just to give you a comparison, let's go do the set. Come on, you bugger. Just for a comparison, we'll go and recheck the one that I wound. I'm using that one there. Uh, let's put it on the primary over here. Right, here we go then, two, three, four. Right, we're on the lower range, one micro amp. See the insulation's a lot better. It was bottoming out at the one on the old transformer. I've got three. So that's three times by ten thousand. Oh, what's that? Thirty thousand megaohms. A lot better, isn't it? Here we are on winding number three, EHT winding. We've got two on there, which will give us 750 volts at about half an amp, a bit more than half an amp. On this winding, I've wound a big load of uh, yellow tape over the top of the last winding because I was finding it difficult. As you see, I've been winding at 10, then another 10, then another 10. That gives us like a little bit of a gap between the inside diameter and outside diameter to make up for that if you with me and it also is a way of keeping track of how many windings I've put on how many turns I've put on problem is though I was finding was when winding the last winding on top of the one underneath that was that the turns weren't falling you know they were falling in gaps or whatever so this I put this uh, what do you call it, this um, yellow tape on there to give us a smoother surface to wind onto if that makes sense, so that was where our last winding finished we've got a gap there, so that, no sorry, that was where our last winding finished, that was where it started so we'll wind this bit on first and then continue on and I've only got, how many more have I got to put on? another four I think, yeah Anyway, keep winding. Well, there's another 440 turns on the old transformer there. We should be getting 303 volts AC, RMS. And we are, what, 4, 7 volts short. Fear not, all we've got to do, I mean, we'll, we could just leave that really. It's only going to be, what, it's only going to be, what, 10 volts short. But I'm going to add on... I'm going to add on another 10 turns, I think. And then I think when I've got this one on, we're going to celebrate and get an 813, power it up, and use that as a load to test the transformer. Right, we've got four windings on the big, tran uh, big old transformer now, which should give us about 1,500 volts. Over here, We've got four bridge rectifiers. I'm using avalanche diodes, 
rectifiers. Let me show you how this thing is wired. Easier if we look in a drawer. Okie dokie, this is what we've got. hope you can make sense of it. Bit hard to do fine detail with the old uh, blobby pen. There's a primary, 240 volts-ish AC going in, mains AC. We have 304 volts-ish AC coming out on the secondary. That's unloaded. When that gets loaded down, it's obviously less. It drops away about 20 volts or more. And then so in each one of these we've got about 390 volts across each of these caps. So as you can see they're all stacked on top of each other. And then we've got four resistors, each one at 180k. And because of the blue job is blue resistors are usually high voltage types, we should be fine there. Although I don't know what the spec has, they're just some I got given, so who knows. Oh yeah, the only other thing I didn't do is to put fuses in there. So these fuses, as you can see, four fuses, each at 180, no, what am I talking about? Each at 500 milliamps. Let's get some coffee. Now then, at the moment I've got a load of 3K9 on there. Uh, which should mean about 400 milliamps. I like to always have a load when I'm testing high voltage because it pulls the voltage down afterwards. These resistors will pull it down somewhat but it'll take quite a bit of time. That 3k, well let's just call it 4k load, will pull them down faster. We're going to test it in a minute. Uh, what else to say? Right, yes, high voltage fusing. Not easy. Uh, on these fuses here, uh, these ones, I'm using 250 volt rated fuses. So we can probably get away with that. But for something like this, on the high voltage side, it's going to be problematic to find a proper fuse. Because most Industrial high voltage fuses are high voltage as well as high current. So it is possible to get, say we eventually put two more windings on here to give us 2500 volts. Then to find a 2500 volt, say one amp slow blow fuse is going to be problematic. As I said, the industrial fuses, you can get them, but it will probably be related for something like 3000 volts at about, oh, I don't know, 400 amps or something stupid. And the other thing is they're expensive. You're talking about 163 quid just for a few, probably more. Other people I've heard using a resistor, uh, something like a 1 ohm resistor. Now then, the problem we've got, 820 microfarads each these caps are but because they're in series obviously that goes down I can't quite work. I don't know what it is it's it's still a lot though I have a lot of energy in here and with DC as well so with an AC fuse right, let's, where's my pen with an AC fuse there's your AC fuse here it comes there but you see here if this is our midway point it's dropping to zero volts so if we get a short circuit here and the f fuse blows because that drops to zero volts any arc because remember if we've got a high voltage here the voltage wants to jump over over to there and there probably will be an arc so any arc we will get because the it's AC and it drops to zero volts the arc will extinguish more readily than if it is DC with DC say two kilovolts over here we've got a short circuit here it will basically try to maintain that arc so a fuse has to be longer Right. fuse has to be longer. 
the other thing is you've got two kilovolts, loads of capacitance, loads of energy, any short circuit here goes bang, 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 glass everywhere, fucking chaos. So obviously, I'm, probably a lot of you will know this, but what they do usually is to make a very, uh, you put the fuse inside of a solid ceramic tube filled with sand to absorb any bang, any explosion, any dissipation of energy. Uh, and the other thing, as I said, when I was looking around for fuses, you can get oil filled fuses. Oil is good because any arc is going to be damped by the oil. So as it is at the moment, I'm looking at, well, when the amplifier is built and everything, I'm looking at maybe using just a 1 ohm resistor, long leads, as long as we can get it. And obviously we've got, I'm going to have to test this. Something, you know, small. If that blows, then hopefully that will extinguish it. Obviously it's going to have to be in a some sort of uh, container. Right, well, some hours later, after a bit of work and a bit of head scratching, got a test set up to test an 813 in situ, as it were, with the old big old uh, transformer, just for a bit of fun, really, and just to give us a bit of impetus to wind the other... Yeah, it's about a thousand turns, anyway. So, it looks complicated, it isn't. Here's the doings here. So I hope that makes sense. So here's a big transformer. Here's a centre step of the big transformer. Basically we're using a big transformer as an auto transformer. So it comes off the centre step onto there and then we've got that going to our 210 volt tap. That's supplying our 813 filaments and then the middle of that on the centre tap of this secondary winding we've got a 1 R 1 ohm resistor. Hope you can see that. That's going to our ground. This is our ground. All the fuses for the HT supply are pulled at the moment just so I've been able to test it and get it all set. Also connected to the mains here is this transformer which is our negative bias supply, so that's a bridge rectifier. I think we've got a couple of, what are they, 150 microfarad maybe, something like that. So we've got 150 ohms, 150 microfarad, another 150 ohms, another 150 microfarad. That's forming two RC filters to give us roughly 180 minus 180 volts which goes into this pot here. One end is connected to ground, one end to minus 180. That gives us 85 volts going through this blue wire into grid one of the 813. So that's that, that's the filament supply. You know about the EHT supply. We've got our magic high voltage wand on there monitoring the EHT voltage. Lastly, one gubbins that I haven't drawn over there is a load of Zena diodes in series powered through a 1K5 resistor. So that gives us, we should have two milliamps on the screen grid plus about 25 milliamps for the Zenas. I think I've done that wrong, I don't know, whatever, it should be about right anyway. Each of these zeners is high voltage zeners, there are two, what are they, there are two, two 130 volt zeners, two 180 volt zeners, and this blue one here is a 75 volt zeners. So it should give us about 750 volts for the screen grid. Obviously, one end of the string of the zeners is going to ground, the other end to the tap here on our basically halfway or should I say the yeah half of that EHT which should be 750 volts I think that's about it now then 
I've had a beer because it's getting that time of the day. I ain't going to touch this anymore now. We're dealing with 1500 volts from a very low impedance source which if I fuck up it can kill. So I could power it up and everything. I'm dying to power it up but caution, caution, caution Will Robinson. Or is it warning Will Robinson? I can't remember. One of them. Obviously this shit can kill if you're going to replicate anything like this in your workshop be sensible if you're tired if you've had a beer or anything leave well alone leave the bogger well alone don't even go there right we had a bit of uh, horrible nasty windy weather this morning and last night it's just rained and now the sun's come out english weather eh anyway enough of me waffling about the bleeding weather got the test set up here uh, I mentioned that in the last video if I remember correctly. Let's power it up. So, over here we've got the HT divided by 10 I think. I, can't, I can never bloody remember, sorry my head. Uh, I'll tell you what it means when we get there. We've got an 813 inch socket, top cap on. We've got our crazy sort of safety fuse type thing. At the top, we are reading, or we will be reading, the grid 2 voltage. Here we're reading the voltage. Somewhere across there, you see there's a 1.2 R resistor. We're reading the voltage across that to try and see if we can read the filament current. What else we got? Oh, and over here. We have the Fluke 25 reading the bias. Alright, let's crank it up. Okay, so that is 150 volts. Minus 7 there, you can see. And 80 up there. Let's crank it up a bit more. So now we are reading 1200 volts EHT, HT. You can see the old filament is going very brightly. We're reading 600 volts on the screen grid. So let's crank it up a bit more. One thousand four hundred volts EHT, two hundred and forty volts mains voltage, one thousand five hundred and eighty. If you can see that, seven hundred and fifty eight, fifty nine, sixty on the screen grid. Filament is a lot more brighter. And minus 76 on the control grid. Now, now the bias, I've re uh, altered it to where it should be at minus 84. Right, okay, you cool, you jipper. Right, that uh, made me jump. It's getting a bit of a thing, isn't it, here with uh, high voltage and bangs? We had this, didn't we, with the fire -tron. Right, EHT is still there, that's not reducing, it will eventually drop. Right, bang. So obviously we were pulling far too much current through those Zener diodes. Right, that's a lesson learned then, isn't it? Right, that's what's left of our Zeners. Literally blew the arse right out of it. Amazing. Blew the, um, it went with such a bang that uh, it's blown the solder. I mean, it was only tacked, but yeah, interesting. Okay, so, well, that's a lesson learned. I must have miscalculated the uh, thing for the resistor there. Uh, yeah, it's blown the arse out of this resistor as well. Oh, well, that's interesting. I don't think any damage has been done there. Oh look, hold on, well now we've got some broken uh, fuses there. 
I've got two fuses that are broken and two that seem to be all right. So two fuses are gone, but our uh, main fuse didn't go. But basically what I would think happened is, right, is as soon as those um, zeners blew, we've got no voltage on the screen grid, so therefore our anode current is going to drop. I don't think it's damaged the uh, 813 at all. So basically, it's, you know, it should have protected itself. Everything else is cushy. So yeah, well, we survived another bang. So, with that, I'll bid you adieu. Thank you again for watching. Ta-da for now.